This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. All who are able, please stand as we read together the call to worship in the bulletin. <coughs> Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For he is loved toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Amen. In unison, we pray together the prayer of invocation and confession, as printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Almighty God, who knows our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking, set free your servants from all anxious thoughts about tomorrow. Make us content with your good gifts and confirm our faith that as we seek your kingdom, you will not allow us to lack any good thing. Provide, therefore, whatever you see to be necessary for our health and salvation. Oh, with your fatherly love and compassion, give us whatever else would truly bless us and the mercy to forgive us all our sins. You know all our desires. Therefore, perfect in us what your Spirit has awakened us to ask in prayer. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing him 276, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Thank you. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are excited to see each and every one of you here this Mother's Day. We're grateful for your presence with us. As we gather together for worship, we are always honored to have our guest with us today. And those of you who are visiting because of mom being here or for whatever reason, we are glad that you are here and worshiping with us. And we pray that this service will be a blessing to you. So that we might be able to call each other by name at the close of the service, in the pew in front of you, you will see the pew pad. If you will pass that down your pews so that everyone has an opportunity to register your presence with us, we would be most gracious and honored for you to be uh, doing that for us today. And again, we, we want to welcome all of you who are our guests today here. And to those of you who are worshiping with us by way of television, we're always grateful that you enter into this time of worship with us at your home or wherever you may be. And please know that as you worship with us where you are, we are remembering you in our prayers here at First Presbyterian Church. And we are grateful for your presence with us by way of television. Just one brief announcement for you this morning. Summer is almost here. And that means Vacation Bible School is almost here. Registration is open for you to register your children and grandchildren, your neighbors, to come and be a part of our Vacation Bible School and hope that you will do that. If you will register now, that will help us with our planning as we prepare for the children to come and be part of Vacation Bible School. And also in the bulletin, you will see a list of items that we need. So if you would uh, take your bulletin insert and take that home with you and pay attention to all of those items that we need to gather up before Vacation Bible School, that would be a big help to us. And please, as we approach Vacation Bible School, Keep that time in your prayers. One of the highlights of the year for me is being able to participate and being a part in Vacation Bible School. I do not remember a time in my life when I was not involved in Vacation Bible School. And as far as I am concerned, I will never be too old to participate in Bible School. And since I'm the pastor, I can make that kind of declaration. So. Register your children, your grandchildren, and your neighbors, and we're looking forward to a wonderful time of Vacation Bible School in the, in the coming weeks. Now I'd like to invite all of the children to come up for the word to the children. You're going to sit right here. You're going to sit against the ring. Good morning. How are y'all doing today? Good. I have a question. What's today? Mother's Day. Raise your hand if you wish your mama a happy Mother's Day. Well done. 100%. Good job. What are some of the things that moms do for y'all? What do your mommies do for y'all? What? She cooks. What else? Okay, what else? She buys all your clothes. Good. Titus? She does the laundry. All right, what else? She cleans the house. She takes you places. She buys your toys. Linda? She buys your food. She takes care of. Good one. That, well, well said, Lindley, because that goes right into what I was going to say. She, the, your mamas take care of y'all. And that is important. It is important that you have somebody who takes care of you all the time. You know who else takes care of you? Who else? What's that? Your dad. That's right. And the church. The church takes care of you. In fact, when we baptize our children, we have everybody in the room promise that they are going to take care of the children of the church, okay? So guess what? We're about to have a baptism 
right now, and I'm gonna need y'all's help in a second, okay? So I want you to stay right where you are, and I'm gonna invite the Quinnies forward as we baptize Sloan. Rob and Kelsey come on forward, and then big sister Jessica is going to help out. She's not only a big sister, but she's Sloan's godmother. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me, so go therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember that I am with you always until the end of the age. And then in Galatians we read, As many of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There's no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus and confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us as his very own, and we remember that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death and washes us clean. We are united through baptism with our Lord Jesus Christ in his death and his resurrection. So we remember with joy our own baptisms as we celebrate the sacrament. Kelsey and Rob, since Sloan isn't quite old enough to uh, name the faith of her own on, on her own terms, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and then I'm going to ask the children a question, okay? Kelsey and Rob, do you desire that Sloan be baptized? And relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to teach that faith to Sloan? And children, kiddos, I have a question for you. Do you promise to take care of babies like Sloan and to tell these kids that they are loved so much by Jesus? If so, say yes. And do you, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to take care of Sloane, teaching her the Bible stories and showing her through how you live your life what it means to follow Jesus Christ? Do you? Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the countless ways you have revealed yourself and have blessed us with signs of your grace. Through the waters of the sea, you led your people Israel out of bondage into freedom into the land of your promise. We praise you for sending Jesus, your son, who was baptized in the waters of the Jordan River and anointed by your Holy Spirit. Through the baptism of his death and resurrection, you set us free from death and give us rebirth. Pour out your spirit upon this water, that this font may be your wound of new birth. And may she who now passes through these waters be delivered from death to life, from sin to righteousness, and bind her to the household of faith, guard her from all evil, and strengthen her to serve you with joy. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Hello. Oh. There's a blanket there. Oh. <laughs> I've done this before. I'm so sorry. Man, congregation will ne never let me forget that one. What is the Christian name of this child? Okay, let's see if we can support your head while we do this. Sloan Martin Quinney, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. She's spitting up all over me. But that's okay. We preachers, we have a tendency to say some bad stuff out of our mouths all the time, so. <laughs> Hello, Sloane. 
This is Sloan. She is a beautiful, beautiful young lady. Now, I bring her to y'all with some, with a lot of happiness and a little bit of sadness though too, because Sloan is moving to the land of Spurrier. <laughs> she is moving to Columbia, South Carolina with her, where her daddy is now working and they're gonna be moving at the end of the May. But I want y'all to remember something. We promised to take care of her. No matter where she goes, we lift her up in prayer. We support her, we support her family, we support them because she is a member of this body of Christ. So no matter where we go, we remember that this is our home. So Sloan, little one, you little beautiful girl, no matter where you go, I want you to remember something. Even if it's in Columbia, South Carolina, even when they try to pull you away and be a Gamecock fan, Remember that Tuscaloosa is your home. Remember that First Prez is your home. Uh, I've never looked better in this robe, I don't think. All right, Jessica's going to pray for Sloan. Heavenly Father, we pray for Sloan to lead a life rich in the teachings of the Bible. Surround her with your love and protect her from evil. We pray that Sloan will always call on Christ in prayers of thanks and prayers of peace. Guide and support Kelsey and Rob as they lead Sloan through her faith journey. We pray that she always enriches the lives of the people she meets. Fill her with the Holy Spirit and receive her into the family of your church that she may walk with us in the way of Christ and grow in the knowledge of your love. Amen. Amen. Here are some gifts for Sloan, her baptism certificate, her story about her baptism, and her baby's first Bible. Thank you, James. Yeah. We all find our home in the grace and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so let us stand now together as our children go to godly play and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious God, without your Holy Spirit, we could know nothing of the truth of your word. And so we pray that today your Holy Spirit will open our hearts and minds to understand that truth and to apply that truth to who we are as your people. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit that enables us to live and gives us life and community together. All of this we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me to Exodus chapter 2, I'll begin reading in the 23rd verse. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. These few verses mark a turning point in the Exodus story. The king of Egypt is dead. That signifies a real turning point. The king, the Pharaoh, who had, 
that Moses ran from into Midian, who wanted his life, is now gone and off the scene. And it signifies a transition, not only in Israel's life, but in history. And so the writer of Exodus lets us know that the king of Egypt is dead and something new is about to happen. It's, he puts it there for one reason. There may be many reasons, but one in particular. God is about to act. In Isaiah chapter 6, the passage that I'm sure you're familiar with, Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Another way that you could paraphrase that verse is to say that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the true king. That's what's happening here. The king, the pseudo-king, is now off the scene. And the real king is going to make himself real to his people Israel, He's going to make himself known to the Egyptians. And God is about to intervene in the history of Israel and his family. And he's going to bring them out. And so with the pseudo-king gone and off the scene, the real king is now going to show himself. The verses let us know that Israel is trying to find its voice. Notice how many times in just these couple of verses... The words cry and groan are used. The groans signify the slavery that they are under and the oppression that they are experiencing. The groans signify the fact that they are being treated like slaves with hard manual labor, both in the fields of Egypt as well as in the brick making that Pharaoh had ordered. Those groans and cr- have has reached to the ears of God and their oppression is becoming great. And they cry out. They find their voice. Slaves aren't supposed to complain. Slaves aren't supposed to be heard. They're just simply supposed to do their work regardless of what that means to them. They are simply supposed to be quiet and do their work and do their business. But here, Israel finds its voice. And they cry. And God hears them and responds to what is going on. In the next verse, the writer uses four verbs. And with each of the four verbs, he mentions the name of God. He doesn't use any pronouns. He just calls God by name. So he says, God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice. It is not that God has been off the scene and has finally shown up. It is not that God has been twiddling his thumbs up in heaven and uh, not paying any attention to what was going around, on, going on on earth, and not paying any attention with what was going on with the people he has called to be his own. What the writer of Exodus is telling us is that God is about to act. God is about to kick it into gear. The pseudo-king is gone, and the God on, on His throne is going to make Himself known. So He hears what the people are groaning about. He sees their plight. He looks upon them and takes notice of them. And that word, take notice, is the word for know. In other words, God is identifying with His people. He doesn't just know in some kind of book-learning kind of knowledge. God knows because of His identity with His people and the love that He has for them. So He has taken notice of their plight. All of those verbs indicate that God is about to act. When God sees and remembers, God is about to go into action to deliver His people. And what God does is He identifies the slaves in Egypt with the promises that He has made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When God makes His power known, God is going to become real to the people of Israel. 
God is going to be their God. No longer will He just be the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is going to be their God. The faith of their ancestors was going to become their faith as they see God work in miraculous ways to deliver them. Because what they are about to see, the only explanation for it will be that God is at work. I don't know that we will ever be able to figure out on this earth and understand why there is such evil and oppression and burdens in this world. I don't know if we can ever fully grasp the reasoning behind it or ask the why questions and come up with a, with a real answer that can satisfy us. There are some things we just do not know. But in this story, in this account of what happens to Israel, God makes it clear that He has not been hiding away. God makes it clear that He has not been deliberately ignoring them. He's heard their cries. Just like blind Bartimaeus, as Jesus was walking out of Jericho, stands on the, he stands on the side of the road, and he says over and over again, Lord, have mercy on me. And the crowd that was around Jesus and, and surrounded him pushed this blind beggar off to the side and said, Hush, be quiet. We're busy here, ignoring Jesus. But he still cried out and said, Lord, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped the crowd and healed Bartimaeus. The people of Israel have cried out, Lord, have mercy on me. And God hears them and comes to them and brings them a salvation that only God can take the credit for. When God promised Abraham that he was going to be a, the father of many people and of a great nation. He told Abraham, I am going to give you this land where you're an alien. And this land is going to become your land. But he not only gave us the promise of territory, he said to Abraham about his descendants, I will be their God. That is probably a bigger promise than the promise of territory. More important than the promise of the acreage of Palestine is the promise that God gave to Abraham that I will be their God. So God is now going to come on the scene in a big way. He is going to show Israel that I am going to be your God. And I am going to demonstrate it in such a way before your very eyes that you can have no doubt that you're my people and that I am your God. That you can have no doubt that I have heard the cries and the groans that, you have, that have risen up to heaven. There will be no doubt in your mind that I am walking with you in these days. I am going to fulfill my promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I am going to be your God. I will not understand until I get into heaven why evil is present in our world today. And then when I get to heaven, it won't matter. But I know this. As, as short as my understanding is on that topic, I know for certain that the Lord is my God and He hears and remembers and He looks upon and takes notice of all that is going on in my life and all that is going on in your life. And when God does those things, God is about to act. I don't understand the timing. Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, said that in the fullness of time, God sent His Son 
to redeem us. When the time was right, God sent Jesus to give salvation to us. When the fullness of time came, when the timing was right in God's sight, He brought salvation to us. When the timing is right in your life, you will know the presence of God, that His promises are true, that regardless of how old those promises might be, God has not forgotten. He will remember the promises that He gave to you in His Word. He will remember the commitment that He made to your salvation. He will remember those promises and He will sustain you and He will keep you and He will deliver you from all your troubles. That He will be our God and we will be God's people. That's the promise that He gives us. In the fullness of time, He will make Himself known. And with, to that we say, thanks be to God. His promises are true. Amen. Well, it's that time of year, isn't it? When our seniors put on those caps and those gowns. And we say, in some ways, goodbye to them, but we also want to remind them that we're always here. So I'm going to invite members of the graduating high school class of 2015 forward um, as I call your name, and you will get a gift from Luann, and then you can stand right here, okay? Davis Byers, graduate of Future, well, about to be a graduate from Northridge High, headed to Mississippi State. Parker Keller goes to Hillcrest High, about to attend Alabama. Price McGifford, who will be graduating from Tuscaloosa Academy and will also be headed to Alabama. Kyle Neighbors, who will be graduating from Hillcrest High. And he, too, will be headed to Alabama. You can get your blanket. Kathleen O'Neill, who goes to Tuscaloosa County, and she will also be going to Alabama. Griffin Sheffield, Hillcrest High, headed to Alabama. Crimson Tide did a good job with this class. <laughs> Anna Shelby, who comes down from her high school, Episcopal High in Alexandria, Virginia, and she will be an SMU Mustang. And Benjamin Wright from Northridge High School will be headed to Millsaps College. I want to say a couple of words to y'all, okay? First thing, just a couple pieces of advice. When you get to college, call your mama. <laughs> if you get to that point where you think, it's been a while since I talked to my mom, it's too late. You need to pick up the phone and call them right that minute. I just want to say that on Mother's Day, I think it's altogether appropriate. Don't forget to call your moms, your dads, your family members, and remember who helped get you to the place where you are right now. There's a theme today. With the baptism of Sloan, I said, remember where your home is. Remember where you came from. You may be headed off to Dallas. You may be staying here in Tuscaloosa. You may be headed over to Millsaps. Whoever, wherever it is you're going, I want you to remember where you came from. It says a lot sometimes about what we have and what we wear. Sloan today was wearing her baptismal gown that was also worn by her mama and her aunt. She was claimed by them as family. And so we give you this blanket that has a very familiar quote 
that I believe closes every high school Sunday school class here. Fight the good fight. Remember, this is your church. That we lift you up. That we make baptismal vows to every child in this church that we will take care of you your whole lives long. And that doesn't stop when you walk across the stage here in a couple of weeks. We're always thinking about you. We're always here. We always love you. And remember that wherever you go, the Lord our God steps before you. So remember that you are claimed, that you are loved, and that here is your home. I'm going to pray for you. Lord, it is true that you do clothe us in love and you wrap your arms around us. And the church is called to do the very same thing, no matter where it is we go. So as these high school seniors move on to what's next, help them to remember where their home is. It is with you. It is with this church a church that blankets them with the love of Jesus Christ. May they remember that now and always, in Christ's name. Amen. Y'all can go back to your seats. It is especially important as we approach times of transition that we remember and stand faith, stand strong in our faith. I invite you now, invite us all to affirm our belief using a confession, a portion of a confession that came out of the Reformation, a time of incredible transition. Please stand with me as we speak together a passage from the Scots Confession. Friends, what do we believe? We confess and acknowledge one God alone, to whom alone we must cleave, whom alone we must serve, whom only we must worship, and in whom alone we put our trust, who is eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance, and yes, distinct in three persons the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, by whom we confess and believe all things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, to have been created, to be retained in their being, and to be ruled and guided by his inscrutable providence, for such end as his internal wisdom, goodness, and justice appointed to the manifestation of his own glory. Please be seated. As we enter now into this time of worship, of bringing our gifts because of our love for God, we do so with gratitude for your response to feeding the homeless in Tuscaloosa. We thank you for your generosity in carrying, being Christ's body here in this city to show and demonstrate Christ's love. Thank you for feeding the poor. Thank you for looking after the homeless. As we bring our gifts, God's tithes, and our offerings, let's do so as we honor his word that says the tithe is the Lord's.
Please be seated. This is the Lord's table. The Savior invites you, invites all who trust in him to come to this feast that he has prepared. Presbyterians practice an open communion. All who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for their salvation is invited to come to this table. The invitation comes from our Lord and is extended to you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Let us pray. See, Lord, we come to you that we may be enlivened by your gift and delight in the holy banquet which you have prepared for the poor. You know that all we can or ought to desire is in you. You are our salvation and redemption, our hope and strength. Gladden the soul of your servants this day because we raise our hearts to you, Lord Jesus. Like Zacchaeus, we desire to bring you into our homes, that we may merit your blessing and be numbered among the children of Abraham. Give us yourself, it is enough. For without you there is no consolation. Without you we cannot exist, and without your appearance we cannot live. We must come to you often and receive strength for our salvation. Test, at least less, less deprived of this heavenly food, we grow weak on the difficult way. Once while preaching, you said, I will not send them away hungry, lest they faint among, along the way. So deal with us likewise. You have l left us yourself in this sacrament for our consolation. So now, as your children, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We give thanks that the Lord Jesus, on the night before he died, took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Will the elders now come forward?
body of Christ, bread of heaven. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it and do this in remembrance of me. For every time that we eat this bread and we drink from this cup, we proclaim the saving power of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes again. Jesus Christ's blood shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. 
Faithful God, we give thanks for the bread and the cup which renew our minds and bodies and give testimony to your never-ending love to, towards your people. Make our hearts strong with this love towards one another. Teach us to keep faith that our witness may be bold, our love deep, and our faith true. Pour out your Spirit upon all people, that we may live your justice and sing in praise the new song of your wondrous victory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us now stand as we sing hymn 281, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Now go in peace, and may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you now and forevermore. Amen.